today is John Skeet. John, how are you, sir? Hi, not so bad. Not so bad. Warm in, in my shed, which I'm currently in. You're in uh, a shed? Yes. So this is, and in fact, I can open the curtains and you'll see, uh, that's my house at the bottom of the, well, at the other end of the garden. So I'm at the far end of the garden, as it were. <laughs> Excellent. I have a virtual background here. And this is, <laughs> although it's not really what's behind me, it's actually the same view that I see when I look that way. Like, it's, uh -huh. from a, it's from a different day, so the clouds are different. <laughs> but other than that, this is downtown yeah, so, Chicago. So I love my home office uh, in the shed, um, but it does get kind of warm in the summer. I do have some AC, uh, but it's a portable AC and it's quite loud. But uh, yeah, uh, it's the one downside. That's great. It's nice to have that privacy. Yeah. Uh, now, I, don't, I, don't want, I didn't come today to talk about your day job, but what is your day job? <laughs> so uh, I am a, what's my official title? Uh, staff software, um, no, staff developer programs engineer. I think so somewhere around the developer ag advocacy somewhere between a developer advocate and a software engineer. Um, so really I build the .NET client libraries for Google cloud platform. Oh, um, yeah, not just me, but our team does. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you also do a lot of cool stuff in your spare time, right? Yep. Uh, so uh, I, in terms of tech stuff, um, probably well, best known for contributing on stack overflow. If you're famous. Uh, for I, I have a book, uh, C Sharp in Depth, uh, which I desperately need to get started on a fifth edition at some point. I just haven't got around to it yet. Um, and I am the main author and maintainer of the Node of Time date and time library. Right. Um, outside technology, uh, when theaters are open, I love a good show. Um, committed Christian, feminist, you know, just you know, various things. <laughs> Outstanding. And I, I, you and I went to see a show when I was in London last year and had a great time. We did. Yes. Yes. Oh, back in the heady days when shows existed. I, we had, when I used to be able to travel to London. <laughs> right. Yes. And in fact, I would be coming to Chicago at the end of September. Um, but I'm thinking probably not. Uh, I wouldn't book the flight just yet. <laughs> oh, unfortunately, I booked it before all of this started. The one time, the only time I was you know, ahead of myself. Book something. I hope it's postponed rather than said. I'd love to get to Chicago. I someday, someday. Um, I want to uh, come and see that story. Apart from what's, the tell me about the. I see some drums behind you. I know you have a project right. that you're working yes. on with your drum kit. So uh, this is a Roland TD27 module on a mixture of well, it's a TD27 upgrade to a TD17 KVX. Now that kind of doesn't need to mean much. Not to me, uh, it doesn't. But, but those are right. models of drum kits, right? Oh, yes, of electronic drum kits. And of electronic, electronic, okay. The, that doesn't the, look electronic. It looks like a, just a regular drum kit. Yeah, so I mean, that's one of the things. And in fact, if I tilt my, my camera again, uh, this is the snare drum that I had on the TD-17. And you can see it's kind of only about that thick. And oh, it doesn't really look much like a snare drum. Whereas this one looks like a proper snare drum. And um, okay, other than being black and plasticky, rubbery, um, that's kind of a reasonable size for a ride cymbal as opposed to the, the smaller cymbals you know, on, on slightly cheaper kits. Um, so yes, it looks kind of... It's at the upper end of things, so it's getting towards looking and feeling a bit more like real drums, um, which I have never played acoustic drums. I want to make this ah, very clear. Interesting. And, uh, we should not talk about how good I am on the drums. <laughs> I'm really not. Um, however, the fact that they're electronic is the important bit. So I started off with a TD-17, um, which was already far, far more drum kit than I really needed. So this was back last July. I've had these just over a year. And uh, I went with a friend of mine, Alice, uh, after she'd encouraged me to, to get into all this. And we went to a music store and I was looking at the TD-17 or the TD-1DMK, I think it was, um, which is another Roland kit. I'm sure it's perfectly nice, um, significantly cheaper. I think it had some mesh heads on. So these are called mesh heads. Um, the the white bits are mesh okay. and they sort of feel um, a bit more like a real drum than the, uh, if you imagine a, a more rubberized uh, texture, but on toms and snares, um, it doesn't feel as much like a real drum. Apparently, I wouldn't know not having played a real drum kit. Uh, um, um, we're the same boat there. Right. <laughs> so, so uh, and likewise, you know, it, it wouldn't have sounded as good. 
Um, definitely not. It had uh, sort of, I think, 11 preset kits, and I'll explain module, kit, instrument, pad, trigger, and things in a bit. Um, but what I found really interesting was it clearly wasn't nearly as configurable as the TD-17 and now the TD-27. So I, I looked at both of these modules, and the, the salesperson in the store did a good job of demonstrating, oh, you can change the reverb and the chorus and... Hmm add lots of different effects and make it sound like you're on a concert stage or in an arena or all of these things that I'm a very, very novice drummer. I'm hardly going to notice the difference. <laughs> but you can tell when you put a, a lot of echo in, on or whatever. Right. Uh, an um, arena sounds different than a little jazz club, for example. Right. Um, but the main thing was it was clear there was a lot to configure. And I saw the USB port and I thought, I wonder, I wonder whether I can <laughs> configure that through code. And in fact, it was one of those rare times, and I'll come back to a theatre connection in a minute. It was one of those rare times. You have an idea. I had an image in my head of what the app would look like. Um, I won't launch it now because I want this to be more of a human conversation than, a, than a, you know, showing you bits of code. Um, but basically, there's a tree view with um, a tree of things you can configure, and then... For each of those, it's, it's got what you can configure about it. So as an example, um, there are on this one module, so the module is the, the bit of kit that has all the buttons on, um, and that takes all the, uh, all the analog and digital inputs from the triggers and pads. Um, difference between trigger and pad is a, a single pad, like um, this Tom pad has two triggers in it, one for the head, one for the rim. Mm. Um, it takes all those inputs and turns them into sound and into MIDI and into you know, stuff. So you can configure on this one module a hundred different drum kits. So it's, it's like if you were playing in a concert, you'd say, OK, I now want a drum kit that's suitable for jazz. And you know, it's got an appropriately you know, bright sound or whatever. And then I want one that's suitable for heavy metal. And then I want one that's got just cowbells just nothing but cowbells in the whole kit this is a, this is to uh, emulate those those progressive rock bands of the Absolutely. 80s 70s and 80s where they had like drum kits that were cross span the entire back of the stage and sometimes even two or three drummers right and and this wouldn't change um you know this is already more drum kit than i can reasonably handle it's got um three toms two crashes a ride snare kick and a hi-hat um and you will see people with you know, multiple rides, um, more than you know, four toms instead of three. I do also have a little, um, there's a little bar trigger on the top of one of these. This was just an, a little extra that I'll talk about in a bit. Um, so for each of those pads, you can give it a different instrument. So you can make them all cowbells, or you could say, do you know what? I want my kick pedal to sound like a snare drum. And you know, that's dead easy as far as it's concerned. It's just... I get some input, I create it into sound. I don't care that you're moving your foot and, and a foot hitting a snare drum is weird. No, I will just do the stuff. Um, so you can choose a hundred of those and within each of those hundred, you can configure everything about it. Um, so each individual trigger, what its volume, attack, um, in fact, two instruments per trigger. So you can say, well, this sounds like a cowbell um, with... A, a kick drum underneath it, you know, that, that maybe is permanently there, but soft, or it goes from the main instrument to the sub instrument at a certain crossover, you know, depending on how hard you hit it, it sounds either like a cowbell or like a kick drum. Um, so huge amounts that you can configure and a tiny, tiny little display. So I thought, well, if I have a nice windows app, I can configure all of that. And um, basically I will have fun. And I want this to be the primary That's the thing. the end game right there. <laughs> exactly. So um, it's partly fun because I get to learn more about my drums. It, it gets me using my drums more. Um, but it's also the, the joy of coding and just building something. And it's open source. I realized early on, okay, I want this to be open source because why not? Um, I'm, I can blog about it. I then started saying, hey, conference folks and user group folks, does this sound like an interesting thing for a talk? And um, I have enough privilege that actually it, you know, things like this happen. Um, 
And the, the remarkable thing is that uh, the app kind of looks like it did in my head just over a year ago. And I don't know whether that's a failure of imagination on my part <laughs> that you know, I started with an idea and then, um, or whether it's just, it's the natural interface. Um, it doesn't look as fancy, you know, there are places within it where a graphic equalizer is effectively what you're configuring. Okay. And I could try to use a user control and you know, make something look like a graphic equalizer. Mm -hmm. I haven't gone that far yet. It's, it is still sliders and, and drop downs and some text input, basically. Yeah. I've, I've heard the, the one of the uh, strange things about when moving from a physical equalizer to a virtual one on screen that looks like that. That metaphor, that metaphor kind of fails because so many sound engineers are tactile. They touch right. that, that that interface and move it back and forth, and you lose that. There's nothing to that, and similar to that, Interesting. even on like an iPad or you're. So well, the, you're the touching one, it. See if I've got. You don't it get somewhere. that tactile feedback. The, the one thing I, yeah, I'm wondering whether a surface dial would actually provide that. So, you Maybe. know, you, if yeah. you had two or three of them and you could just dial dial bits up and down, maybe that would give yeah, the same. Yeah, actually the physical thing as opposed to the metaphor, which is what we so often see on a computer screen. Maybe that would overcome that. This, is, this isn't yeah. me talking because I'm not in that <laughs> uh, world at all, but I have heard that from multiple people that that's a, uh, don't bother with the, the, those metaphors. They don't work for us. We're tactile. We, we touch. Interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah. I, and I said that there was a theater connection. It reminded me very much of when I directed an inspector calls which was probably about 14 years ago now. Um, and it was the last bit of amateur dramatics that I did. And I had a one really clear thought when I started directing the play, which was, hey, let's make the, um, you know, I expect most of the audience members who will come to see this play know an inspector calls and know what's going to happen. So let's just make the inspector overly cheerful instead of being very dour and you know, preachy, let's make him really cheerful. And you kind of think he's a bomb that might go off at any time. And it wasn't, you know, I had that idea and I told the cast that's what I wanted to achieve. And then it gradually drifted away. And then on the very last night, after we managed to do um, perfectly reasonable performances of an Inspector Calls, you know, every, anyone would say, that's fine. That was an Inspector Calls. Um, I said, oh, just, just push it to 11, back to the musical metaphors. Um, and bless him, the, the chap who was playing the inspector did, and the rest of the cast followed, and it was something else. And it was so close to what I had imagined before, and that's a real joy. So it's, it's a joy that can come in theatre and in uh, computing, and I guess any creative form, that taking something from just the idea and making it real Absolutely. and it will evolve and change. But when you can see the, the connection between the two, it's yeah. lovely. Uh, so now how does it work? What's uh, tell me a little about the code, right? So uh, the code it's, it's a WPF app. Um, at least the main application is. So I have tried after the initial stab was uh, a console app, in fact, ju to just, can I communicate with this thing? And it communicates over MIDI uh, using something called SysX, System Exclusive Requests, where um, MIDI 1.0, at least, is unfortunately unidirectional. So you send something saying, tell me about your configuration at this address. You can imagine it as like a big block of memory or a big file. Okay. Um, so tell me about the information at this address. And it sends back a command on the parallel channel. So you send it on your output and it sends it on its output, your input, um, saying, here's some memory. And it also sends the same thing. If I change things on there, it sends exactly the same command. So it's not like we've got request response, really. Okay. There's nothing saying this is a response to that request. It's just, here's some data. Ah. So the first challenge was sort of trying to work out some abstraction of that that made sense, that made it feel like request response. Right. And it's really, well, you send a request and wait until you get a response that says, well, here's the data for that thing you just asked for. And if it sends a load of other things, you just kind of ignore them. Hmm. Um, so. I initially did console app to send that and make sure I could get data flowing in both directions. And that was fine. I then wrote a WinForms app uh, and then converted that into a WPF app and then rewrote that entirely 
uh, to be more of a real WPF app. The first WPF version was full of code that created user controls, or sorry, created its controls itself dynamically. Hmm. No view models anywhere, no item sources and things. And then I started buying a couple of books on WPF. It's amazing how there just haven't been any books on WPF for like 10 years. Yes. So <laughs> you sort of think, right, what's the most recent book on WPF? Oh yeah, 2010. I don't hmm. think it's changed in 10 years. Well, I suspect that now that it's available again on .NET Core and you know, we've learned new patterns and things, I suspect that there will be a resurgence. Hmm. Um, anyway, so there's a WPF app. Um, I've tried to make this as decoupled as possible. So in fact, in the solution, there's the, the main model project. And I don't know whether model is an entirely appropriate thing, but that's got sort of the schema for the drum kit okay. because I've mentioned the TD-17 and the TD-27. There's also the TD-50, um, which is a, a really high-end drum kit. Um, and I will come back to another instrument a little bit later because uh, it gets really quite silly. Um, and they all have the same protocol, but different schema. You, you can configure different things. I said that the TD-17 is sort of a mid-range, TD-27 is upper end of the mid-range, okay. and the TD-50 is really high end. Um, so obviously there's more that you can configure, more fields, more containers of fields and stuff. Um, and it's delightful that Roland provides really good documentation, um, just fistfuls of it. Let me see if I can find some that's just sitting on a shelf. Um, so I don't know how visible any of this will be, but that is the schema um, of, in fact, an aerophone, which I will show you in a bit. Um, and it basically says, this, these are the fields at different addresses um, and gives you a bunch of information. So that's all within one project. And it's taken me quite a long time to get the separation right, but I have the model project, a view model project, um, a separate, the, the model project contains interfaces for audio input and output and MIDI input and output. And I then have an N audio implementation in a separate project. And that's so that I can record what comes out. I can record all the instruments here. Yeah, there are 300 instruments to pick from on here. Um, and you don't really want to spend ages saying, right, set that, hit it, set it, hit it, if you just want to be able to browse them. So I've got a way of making it do the sort of change instrument, hit the kick pedal, change instrument, and it records audio files um, that then my app can sort of say, well, what does this one sound like, etc. cetera. Um, so there's an N audio one, there's a managed MIDI uh, that's the normal MIDI implementation. Um, I then have a command line app that also uses the model. So it's, it tries to be as uh, contained as possible and have very, very little bu business logic inside either the console app or the WPF, you know, the UI specific bits. Um, and I've got a separate view model from view. And I don't know whether this is the normal way of doing things, but I wanted it to be testable in terms of um, make the view model really testable. And there are some things that just don't lend themselves to that. And you'll see this in various web pages and nowhere else has quite the same approach that I've done that I've seen anyway. Um, so I have an interface of iView services, I think it is. Um, and that's got things like, please launch a dialog box to save a file or launch a dialog box to open a file or launch the kit explorer or the data explorer or the instrument record bit, etc., And then there's an implementation of that in the view layer, which obviously depends on the view model. And the implementation is you know, one line of code for each of those things. Um, but it means that if I wanted to test the view model, I could say, okay, I will now have this test implementation. Yes, of course you've opened a save dialog box and this is what happened. Okay, now let's have another test that launches a save dialog box and no, the user pressed cancel. Does it do the right thing in that case? Um, so that's all good. I would say for all of that I've made it testable, I don't actually have much in the way of tests. Well, it's um, open source. Somebody else might write it. So, 
maybe maybe um i don't think i've had any pull requests yet but i have had interaction from other people who have similar kits and are, are really interested you know there's there's a genuine use case for this um which is half surprising um but there's one project that i haven't mentioned yet which is the silliest of them which is the blazer project uh so this is blazer as in net blazer uh and you can now, uh, if you had the kit in front of you, you would be able to go to vdrumexplorer.johnskeet.uk. And if any listeners have that, um, it's, it's all one word. And in fact, I'll put it in the, in the chat. Um, vdrumexplorer.johnskeet.uk. Um, and I will actually check that it's the, uh, the correct URL. Yep, I see it. Uh... Yep. Um, so that... It, it's just a demo. It's not the full uh, editor, but that uses um, Blazor to run .NET code. So it's using the same model code, um, but it uses, instead of the MIDI implementation that's Commons MIDI that you know needs to be running locally, it uses my own tiny implementation of that interface that uses the JavaScript web MIDI API so that it's all running locally, but it's using the JavaScript API to get at your drum kit if you've got one. Um, and the silliest possible thing is that one of the ways of connecting MIDI with this drum kit is via Bluetooth. There is, as well as you know, Bluetooth audio, we're all familiar with, yeah. likewise doing keyboard and mice and things, but there's also Bluetooth MIDI. <laughs> and the, the bizarre thing is that you can get my phone connecting to my drum kit over Bluetooth, running .NET in a browser via WebAssembly, and talking to the drum kit over Bluetooth MIDI. And it's like, that shouldn't work. It really, really <laughs> That's amazing. Um, well, I'm still getting, uh, having trouble understanding what exactly does it do? Are you sending commands to actually play the drums? Do you still have to strike the, the drum kit itself? So uh, it's just the different sounds come out based on the commands so you send it. Is that right? No, the, the code I've got, the, or rather, you're right that it doesn't play the drums. It, it's just doing the configuration bit. Okay. So um, if I had my drum kit turned on, and I won't turn it on now because it would have new audio inputs and outputs and it confuses things no end. It'll, it'll dim all um, the lights in, in uh, right, yeah. London as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'd be able to press list kits and it would list all the kits that are okay. on, on the drum kit, um, on the drum module. And then... You know, if I had the editor thing, I could say, "Hey, I want the I want the snare drum to sound like, uh, you know, a cymbal or something," and change that. And then when I did strike it, it would sound like a cymbal. So the idea okay. is that you have you might have a different kit in a separate file for each song that you wanted to play. So um, you know, I, I created a kit for S Club Seven's Reach you know, reach for the stars um, with appropriate tambourine and clap sounds and things. So it, it all sort of works. And I can have that in a separate file anywhere and then load it into the VDrum Explorer and say, copy that onto the, onto the drum module itself at a particular location, mm. turn to that, and then I can play. And so now, can, now it starts sounding like a, a cymbals, for example. We strike the cymbal, it'll sound like a clap. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So um, you know, normally you have a hundred kits on here to play with, um, but suppose you have you want more than a hundred things. Well, you can back up the kits to an SD card and then copy that over. But the VDrum Explorer lets you just kind of manage things as ah. hey, these are files. I just want to load the file. I said there was something silly, and I alluded to it earlier on. Um, now you say you haven't played a drum kit before. That is cool. um, however, I suspect you know enough about drums to know that this is not a drum kit. I recognize that is not a drum. Right. Uh, so, so this is something called an aerophone, um, which is a digital wind instrument. Um, and it's normally meant to sound mostly like a saxophone. So most of the, just as there are 100 kits on there, there are, in fact, 129 preset kits and 100 user kits. Um, that can make this sound like all kinds of things. So this will sound like a pipe organ. Um, and that uses the same protocol as the drum kit. Really? So obviously when I found out, and in fact, I only found out about this 
all all of the silly things that have happened with this have found have happened because of other user group talks I've given. So someone mentioned the whole web MIDI API and said, hey, you could get at that with Blazor. And sure enough, the next weekend was spent doing that. And someone else said, you know, what other instruments does it work with? And I thought, I should have a look on the Roland website. And I found this, found that the MIDI implementation used the same thing. So when I launch VDrum Explorer, if I've got this plugged into it, it will say, yes, I will load the studio kits and see alto sax, tenor sax, pipe organ, jazz scat, etc. cetera. Um, and I just, I just think that's wonderfully silly. Excellent. You can play... Uh... Box fugue in D minor on the saxophone, basically. Uh, so, <laughs> in fact, there is a clip. I will send you a clip of exactly that. Not me playing it, uh, but someone who is rather better at uh, the aerophone, and in fact, is is the one doing most of the aerophone videos that you'll find online. He's sort of world expert aerophone. Uh, does a very good toccata and fugue in. in uh, <laughs> Very cool. Are, are you? Uh, now I noticed that um, a lot of these uh, little projects of yours that, that spark your interest, they turn into conference talks. Yes. Has this, gone, has this evolved into that yet? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I have given this in NDC London, back oh. when NDC London was happening. Uh, I gave it as a talk, and I've been giving loads of user group talks. And it's one of the few talks that actually works better over Zoom because, because I've got the drum kit, with me. drum kit to yeah. London with you. <laughs> um, so normally, you know, I have previously taken. Um, I probably wouldn't take the TD twenty seven, but um, now that I have a sort of spare TD seventeen, so that's the module, and you only need to take the module because that's all that the um, kit talks to, hmm. uh, that the program talks to. Um, but I would probably also want to take my bar trigger. Um, which I showed you there, and I think I'd need a spanner to, to remove, um, to show another practical application of this. So the console app that I mentioned earlier on has lots of different commands for it, and it's, it's mostly for the sake of diagnostic, you know, me finding out what's wrong with bits of the library. But it has a turn page command, where you can say, I wish you to turn the page when you hear this MIDI note. Okay. And then it will send... Uh, it will. It uses the WinForm send keys API, and so it just sends whatever you've configured, and I think it defaults to space or right arrow. I'm not sure. Um, which means I don't play very many songs. I haven't got to that stage yet, or possibly I should be. Um, but uh, what I do like playing is um, Joe. The the name of it's now escaped me. Living on a prayer. Okay, ah, living on a prayer. Uh, great song. Me. Exactly. Fantastic drum part. Not too complicated, not too simple. It's great. Um, and the music for that is a four page PDF that I got uh, from Drumio, an online drumming um, thing that I subscribe to. And um, so I have a, a separate monitor over in front of my drum kit so that when I'm using melodics for, for training, um, I have things going on there. And that's, and that's the great. PDF is displayed. That's where the PDF is displayed. But, you know, you're halfway through the song. What do you do? I don't really want to be reaching over to a keyboard to do stuff. Whereas if I'm drumming along, I can just hit the bar trigger. Ah. And that sends the appropriate MIDI note that my console app says, ah, that means I need to turn the page. And it oh, just works. And it's, it's, it's beautiful. And it doesn't even have to be a, a, an audible sound. You can hit that and it doesn't have to output. In, yes. In theory, I could turn it off. In fact, I haven't bothered turning... Uh -huh. turning the bar trigger down to, to a silent instrument, but I absolutely could, yes. Um, Very cool. I had a different way of doing it with a pedal, which was really quite bizarre. Um, so you can hook up a pedal to the module, and that can take a few different actions, but most of those actions aren't discernible from code. They don't send anything over MIDI. Um, but what I found, you can say, uh, when I press the pedal, go to the next kit. So what I did was write code to say, take whatever kit I'm currently on. So say I'm on number four, which is I think funk rock or something. And that's the one I normally do for, uh, for living on a prayer. Copy that to kits 99 and 100 and set the current kit to 99. Now, whenever you find that, whenever you observe that the current kit has changed to 100, let's assume that's because John's hit the pedal 
turn the page and set the current kit back to 99. Ah, nice. <laughs> it's nice. sort of a so bit it just of a knows novel. where the notes are at the end of the page, I think. Is uh, oh, if it, yeah, I, I should do machine learning and stuff so that it can be <laughs> and, and know when things are coming. Um, but yeah, it's all incredibly silly things and has given me lots of pleasure and also been genuinely useful in terms of giving me more confidence. I've learned about Windows installers, um, signing uh, applications uh, with Authenticode signing. Hmm. Um, I've done uh, documentation for this, learned just so many things. And the WPF side has been really useful because as we were talking before we started recording, I've recently, since lockdown started, um, I've started writing a little Zoom application that uses the Zoom C Sharp SDK. And that's written in WPF. And I probably wouldn't have bothered doing that if I'd had to learn WPF from scratch or at least, you know, uh, remove the rust from my, my 10 years ago WPF. Right. But because I'd done all the drum stuff more recently, I had a good enough idea of what, what would be required. So it's been so, so much fun. I've got so much out of it in terms of conference talks and blog posts and writing the code and talking to people about, you know, what they would, find useful it's been just just great it's fun um, talking about it too i i noticed i'm looking at vdrumexplorer.johnski.uk i see that there is links to your blog posts links to your github repository and right. links to some documentation here this i'll put this in the right. show notes this is a great starting point uh when things open up again do you think you'll start taking this drum kit to conferences that have jam sessions i um uh, like no. NDC Oslo, for example <laughs> they actually have a concert of oh uh, yeah there, there's i would i would be interested to uh, try an acoustic kit just for fun. Um, and in fact, a friend of mine, um, uh, Catherine Mayer, is the widow of um, someone, Andy Gill, who was in Gang of Four. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, so she invited me at some point, if you want to come and play on Andy's um, acoustic drum kit. Oh um, my goodness. So like, wow. Okay. Um, so someday I may do that. May may take her up on that. Um, I would like to play an acoustic kit at some point. Um, but uh, I'm not sure that I'm really ready for jam sessions yet. Oh, because okay. I, would, I would think the skills would be transferable. Is striking <laughs> this thing versus striking an acoustic kit. It's not like guitar oh, no, hero to guitar. Is it? You don't, you don't agree? I, I think so. I'm sure it's transferable. If I were good at the electronic kit, oh, I would okay. <laughs> be good enough. But but no, really, my skills are very very limited. It would be fun to try with very very forgiving people. <laughs> That's exactly the NDC crowd. Okay, as long as well, they're having fun and enthusiastic, yeah. <laughs> people will, people will be cheering. That's been my experience. <laughs> uh, well, John, we're just about out of time. Uh, anything else you want to promote before we go? Uh, I don't think so. No, that's that's most of what I've been, you know, having a lot of fun with. Yeah. Um, promote staying you safe. Some, you got um, some? Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah. So, you know, just general message of stay safe. Coronavirus virus is real. Hopefully, yeah. there'll be a vaccine. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Hopefully, is the um, uh, you have any speaking opportunities coming up virtually? A uh, bunch of user groups, mostly talking about the same thing as we've been talking about, but with going into the code. Um, they're mostly local user groups that, of course, don't need to be local these days. So I think I'm talking with .NET Knots, uh, so Nottingham mm -hmm. group, uh, in a week or so. Um, I kind of lose track, to be honest. Uh, it's, it's hard enough managing a calendar normally, and over the course of the pandemic, I've really lost track of when things are. Yeah, you don't have to schedule the flight, so it's a little bit easier yeah, to ignore I, I the details. Look at the calendar and say, what am I doing this week? Oh, I've got a talk. I'd better prep for that at yeah. some point. Well, John, thank you so much for spending time with us. It's been my pleasure. great talking my to you, my friend. Good to catch up with you as well. It's been too long. In these current very strange times, we may be uh, missing our friends, and I certainly am, but at least we have the technology to get in touch with them virtually, as today. Uh, it's, been, it's been great to catch up, and why not think about that person that you haven't caught up with during the pandemic, and you kind of are missing. Give them a call. <laughs>